Welcome everyone to episode 10 of Ohio Unsolved. I'm your host Matthew, and I just want to thank everyone who takes the time from their day to join me for horror stories and the scary and brutal true stories of Ohio's killers. It's hard to believe that I'm already on episode 10, and before we all know it, I'll be on episode 100. I've loved every second of working on this podcast, and from the bottom of my heart, Thank you all who listen and enjoy this weekly with me. Now with all that being said, sit back, make sure to lock your doors and windows, and get ready for Ohio Unsolved. Our first story today involves murder. Listener discretion is advised. Martha Wise was born in 1883 in Hard Scrabble, Ohio, to Sophia Elizabeth Genke and her husband Wilhelm Hassel, both of whom were farmers. She had three brothers and a sister, although contemporary sources would only name three siblings. Two brothers named Frederick and Paul and a sister named Emma. In 1906, Martha met the substantially older Albert Wise at a box social. Soon the two were married, although Wise never did give her a wedding ring. Martha and Albert did not have a happy marriage. She, soon after she moved onto Albert's 50-acre farm, she quickly discovered that he expected a farmhand more than a wife and life was no less poor as a married woman than it had been when she lived with her parents. Even when pregnant, she was forced to do farm work that was generally male-oriented, such as plowing the fields or feeding the hogs, as well as the usual household chores of baking and cleaning. The couple's first child, Walter, did not survive infancy. The four others, Everett, Gertrude, Kenneth, and Lester, all did. One of the really strange things about Martha was her main source of entertainment during this time period was funerals. She seldom missed a visit to any funeral that was held in or near Hardscrabble, whether she had known the deceased or not. When questioned about this, she would simply say that she liked funerals. Albert Wise died suddenly in 1922 leaving his wife a 40-year-old widow with four children. Her odd behavior and fixation on funerals soon became more noticeable, and she began not only attending funerals, but openly crying and lamenting at them, no matter who had died or whether or not she knew who they were. Within a year of Albert's death, Martha found a new male companion in the form of Walter Johns who worked as a farmhand on property next to her farm. The relationship was frowned upon by her family, and both her mother and her Aunt Lily made no secret of their desire for Martha to end the relationship. By the end of 1924, Martha had given in and the relationship ended. John soon moved to Cleveland and the couple lost all contact. On the night before Thanksgiving in 1924, Several members of the family, including Martha's mother, all fell ill with a severe stomach ailment. The others recovered shortly after, but Sophie's illness worsened, and she died on December 13th. On New Year's Eve, there was more illness. Lily, 
Her husband Fred and several of their children all began suffering from stomach pains similar to those of Sophie. Several family members were hospitalized and Lily and Fred were both dead by February 1925. In total, 17 relatives were taken ill with similar symptoms in the fall and winter of 1924 to 25. Four of the Yankee children were left partially paralyzed from the mysterious illness. After the deaths of the Yankees, authorities began to investigate the sudden cluster of deaths. The county sheriff soon discovered that Martha had signed at a local drugstore for a series of purchases of large quantities of arsenic. An autopsy on Lily confirmed the presence of arsenic in her digestive tract. Brought in for questioning by the sheriff, Martha at first claimed that she had obtained the arsenic to kill rats, but eventually she confessed that she had used it to poison family members by putting it in water buckets and coffee pots that the family had drank out of. Despite her confession, Martha pleaded not guilty to the charge of murdering Lily in front of a grand jury on March 23, 1925. She told the grand jury that she was irresistibly attracted to attending funerals, and that when there were not enough funerals in the community, she was driven to create them by killing. Martha was indicted on a charge of first-degree murder on April 7, 1925. Martha's trial for murder began on May 4, 1925. She was represented by Joseph Pritchard and prosecuted by Joseph Seymour. Defense claims included that Wise was criminally insane and that she was ordered to commit the murders by her former lover, Walter Johns. A number of setbacks plagued the defense, including the May 6 suicide of Martha's sister-in-law, Edith Hassel, and the subsequent collapse of her husband Fred, both of whom who had been prepared to testify for the defense. The recantation of testimony by a man named Frank Metziger, who told the prosecution on cross-examination that the defense had asked him to perjure himself to support claims that Martha was insane, and that her choice to take the stand on her own behalf. Family members, including Martha's son, Lester, and three of the Yankees' children all testified against her. After only one hour of deliberations, the jury found Martha guilty of first-degree murder. They also urged mercy in sentencing, and the judge sentenced Martha to life imprisonment, under the terms of which she could only be freed by executive clemency. In 1962, as a result of Martha's good behavior in prison, the governor commuted her sentence to second-degree murder and she was paroled at age 79. Her remaining family refused to take her in, and a number of rest homes for the elderly similarly declined her residency. Within three days, Martha had returned to prison, lacking anywhere else to go. Her parole was revoked. Martha then died in prison on June 28, 1971. There really is no good way to murder someone, but I think poison is a rough way to do it. The amount of internal pain that it can cause someone, especially during a time when modern medicine isn't readily available. And also, the murdering to create funerals for her to attend just struck me as odd. There, there's definitely something more mentally wrong with this woman that she had to do that. Our next story is about sleep paralysis and being attacked in the night. I will be reading from the author's perspective. I was 16 years old, living in New Philadelphia, Ohio, in a one-room apartment with my father. He had the living room and I slept in the bedroom. So I had my bed placed against the wall with no bed frame and just a mattress with one window in the, in the room. After about only one month of living there, I started to get weird vibes all the time when I came home from school alone. It first started when I came home and I went in the kitchen. 
all of the drawers, the oven, the refrigerator, they were all wide open, which I thought was very odd. A few days later, I came home and I heard a scratching noise in my bedroom. I thought maybe my father was in my room, so I went in there. The noise was coming from my closet, so I opened up my closet and the hangers were moving, scratching the closet door. I didn't really think anything of it. So now, one night, when I was lying down in my bed, I'm a very light sleeper, so I was just looking around my room when I saw the shadow of a body on the wall. That had to have been hanging from a rope. I got a little freaked out, but I still laid there, thinking that someone hung themselves in my room, but where and how? There was nothing on my ceiling. Plus, there were no trees outside of my window that they could have used. Then one night, I had a horrible dream that I was stuck to my ceiling as if something was holding me against it. Then it started to pull me around out into the living room. I could see my father in my dream trying to yell out for him, but it was as as if he could not see or hear me. Then I woke up super sweaty and scared to death. Over the next few nights, I could hear something banging on the door inside of my closet. I didn't really pay too much attention to it one night, even though I thought it might be a bat. I don't know why, but I did. Then, a month later, forgetting about what I had saw, I went to bed and woke up in a way I never want to wake up again. I woke up in the middle of the night around 3.30 with my chest in the air as if someone was pressing on my back and there was a tight grip around my throat all at the same time, making me unable to yell for my father. My heart was beating so fast and I was sweating very hard because my body was just so hot. This went on for a good 30 seconds. I could not move a muscle in my body or even speak a word. Then I just passed out. I woke up in the morning in pain. My whole body was cramped up and my back stung or burned. So I went in the bathroom and I looked in the mirror. I had six, about two to three inch scars on my back. I freaked out and I ran in the bedroom and there was blood on my sheets right where my back was lying. So I pushed the bed against my closet and never moved after this. There were still nights that I heard banging in my closet, but I just closed my eyes and tried to sleep until we moved out a few months later. That is the end of my story. I have only told one person this story before, and they stopped talking to me. Also, after that, I moved out of the apartment down the street. My father still lives there, and every time I go home and I walk down the same streets, I always feel and hear someone right behind me. One fear that I have is waking up in the middle of the night and not being able to move. Having that happen on top of being attacked by an unknown entity would probably scar me for life. Have any of you had an experience with sleep paralysis? I would love to hear about it and share it in a future episode. Our next story is another one about ghosts in a closet. There's even some ghost children. Once again, I will be reading from the author's perspective. It was the first birthday that I had spent away from home, and I wasn't particularly excited about where I was. My father had court in Indiana against his ex he happened to have a son with many years ago. So he and my mother had to drive there and deal with it, leaving my sister and I back at my aunt's house. I had learned my lesson last time that the guest room was not for me. Though the woman in the doorway was beautiful and intimidating, the room itself was full of things that struck fear in me. Ever since my last visit to my aunt and uncle's house, I hadn't been excited about being there. While they played games, I would quietly participate but glance at the stairs between every turn. While they watched a movie, I would hide under the blankets and fear the sun would be going down soon. And when it did, 
my uncle took my hand and led me up the dark stairs. Don't worry, you won't be sleeping in there, he told me. My aunt didn't understand why I wouldn't sleep in the room, but my uncle was more than helpful. He laid down a bed for me on their bedroom floor, and that is where I would sleep for the night. The carpeting was cream and lightly shagged and made for a nice support on my back partnered with two or three comforters from the hall closet and six hardly used pillows. I never sleep with any less. I laid there awake. I didn't fear the room at all, but it was still not home, so sleep still came with a struggle. Eventually, the busy day won the battle and I drifted to sleep until my uncle woke up to go to work. I smiled happily and hugged him a goodbye before climbing in his side of the bed dragging and piling all six pillows along with me. Under my head, legs, and on top of my stomach. Once awake, I was never able to fall back asleep. I was both a morning and night person, and my energy was a force to be reckoned with on any occasion. So I laid in the bed, and as quietly as I could, I began to play with my stuffed animal, talk to him, and listen to the morning birds outside. As I listened to their chirps and flutters, something sounded out of the ordinary. Laughter. Little girls. I slowly snuck out of the bed and I peered out the window, but it was far too early for any of the neighborhood children to be playing outside. Besides that, they had sons, not daughters. The laughter started to become more defined and closer. It echoed through the hallway and stopped. I turned slowly and I looked at the door, frozen in place. My sister was too old to sound anything like that, and she and I were the only young girls in the house. My feet began to take me to the door. As I turned the corner, I saw shapes sitting on the floor by the bathroom. The shapes were two young brunette girls with ponytails and they both looked around my age in light blue and green lace dresses. They sat and played patty cake. When my eyes hit them, they looked up and smiled at me. I had this feeling before. It was unmistakable. The woman in my closet when I was little gave me no fear. She gave me comfort and made me feel safe. This, this was a feeling like the bank man had given me just last year. Fear. Undoubting fear. Though they smiled politely, and in my mind, I heard their voices ask me to join them. The two little girls that sat in front of me were not girls at all. They were evil. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath, preparing myself to tell them to go away as I had learned from my mother but when my eyes opened, they now stood right in front of me. No time, none at all, not even to scream. I turned and ran back to the bed and covered my head crying. I knew this game. Why bother waking my aunt, as I had tried to wake my mother when I was two or my sister when I was nine, and see them sleep clueless and peacefully? Why should now be any different at age 10? try to wake my aunt and watch her sleep clueless and peacefully? It wasn't that I wanted them to see it too. It was that I knew if someone else was awake and had a better chance of going away. While under the blankets, I hid and listened to the silence. Even the birds seemed hushed. Music started to play. No, anything but that music. I grinded my teeth. The Egyptian music lingered through the closet doors, and words I didn't understand accompanied it. No, not this, I said. Silenced by fear once more, the music began to morph into something familiar, but not scary. Aladdin. Music from a Disney movie. Then another. The Lion King. Then The Little Mermaid. I sat up and started to smile. It was reaching out to me as a child. But then again, so were the two girls in the hallway. My smile vanished. No, I crossed my arms as though I had something to prove. 
It wasn't going to get me. I was never going to trust it. The music got eerie once more, and words I knew began to come from an unfamiliar voice. The devil is good. The devil is great. Too much. It was too much to handle on my nose. I screamed at the closet, no, 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 while the tears rolled down my face. I shook my hand harder than I'd ever shaken anyone ever before, crying harder than I ever have, begging her to please wake up. I expected that when she did, the music would stop, but it didn't. She rolled over and looked at me. What's wrong? She asked. What's wrong? Was she serious? Don't you hear it? The music? It was getting louder, but to her, everything was silent. What music? I don't hear anything. She stopped and listened. There is a train coming. Do you hear that? I had lived by trains my whole life. This was no train. No, it's not a train. It's music. It's... And just like that, the music stopped. She pulled me close and held me. That very same day, I heard her on the phone with my mother telling her what had happened. My mother was very supportive when I got home, but that was the day I told her that I would never be back past the white bike, under the double bridge, over the train tracks, across from the construction vehicles. That's all I remember on how to get to my Uncle Cheese's house. And I'm sure that as the years pass further, I will think about that house. I will think about the nights I spent there, and I will think about the girls, and I will think about the night that I escaped the devil in the closet. That story sure escalated quickly. There, there's nothing scarier than, than creepy little kids. And as a 37-year-old man, if, if I were to wake up and even hear kid laughter, I, I would probably poop the bed. But with all that, that does it for episode 10. I truly hope everyone enjoyed the stories. I know that next Friday is Christmas Eve, but I'm planning on having a special Christmas episode, so I hope everyone can spare some time away to give it a listen. I also plan to release the first bonus episode for my patrons the last week of December. Make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Links are in the description. Also, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please rate and review. A five-star rating goes a long way to help others find this podcast. If you enjoy what you hear, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Three affordable tiers to choose from with some pretty cool extras in each. So with all that being said, thank you for taking the time to listen. And make sure to keep your doors and windows locked and stay ready for Ohio Unsolved.